very good afternoon from Singapore and to all our friends and partners from all over the world. Uh, good day or good evening, as the case may be. Um, welcome to Deep Tech Summit 2020. Uh, this is organized by SU Innovate in conjunction with the Singapore FinTech Festival and the Singapore Week of Innovation and Technology. My name is Dre and I'm the CEO of SG Innovate. SG Innovate is a Singapore government-backed venture capital company that invests in and helps to build deep tech companies. Now, needless to say, it has been the most challenging year with the COVID-19 pandemic disrupting our global economy and society. At the same time, SARS-CoV-2 has also proven to be the global chief innovation officer of the year, accelerating science and technology uh, innovation that would normally have taken years into a matter of months. Equally striking and uplifting has been the response to this call to arms, often at great risk to people's physical and corporate beings. Within our own portfolio, companies like Lucent Diagnostics, Bioformis, and Strapto have pivoted from their usual businesses to address the pandemic with innovative products. While simple measures like mask wearing and safe distancing are very effective in preventing the spread of disease, eradication of and subsequent recovery from the pandemic will depend on decidedly deep tech solutions, where we've seen the very successful results from an interim reading of new mRNA vaccines from BioNTech slash Pfizer, as well as Moderna. Uh, going forward in the recovery phase, there will be other companies that will come to the fore. Uh, companies like GoComet, uh, which has a logistics management platform that helps supply chains become more resilient. Uh, companies like Dimuto, uh, which has a blockchain traceability solution for truly digital agri-food supply chains. Companies like Sixth Sense, uh, which has a defect in the analytics platform for smart manufacturing. These will be instrumental in returning some measure of normalcy to the world. Um, so that is the theme for today's discussion. Uh, and we have assembled a great, uh, a select and, and great group of uh, innovation leaders to discuss how, you know, to discuss the role of deep tech uh, in the new world. Now, I don't want to steal the thunder from Ziki, uh, who is the moderator of this session. She's going to lift the lid on the identities of these speakers. So without further ado, uh, I invite my colleague, Ziki, who is the executive director of our community and brand division uh, to get us started with our opening panel on, the deep, on deep tech for a post-COVID-19 world with our speakers from ASTAR, the World Economic Forum, and Microsoft. Ziki, all yours. Thank you, Dri, and hello, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for being here with us today. I'm very excited to be moderating this opening panel on a very important topic that we at SGNIVATE are deeply passionate about. Together with my esteemed panelists, we will be chatting about deep tech for a post-COVID-19 world, specifically, how innovation driven by science and technology can help us build back better and enable our future economy and society to be stronger, more resilient and sustainable. Before we get into the session proper, I would like to ask each of my esteemed panelists to please give a short introduction of themselves. Kay Fur Butterfield, I apologize, Head of AI and Machine Learning, and member of the Executive Committee of World Economic Forum. May I ask you to start, please, Kay? Yes, certainly, thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak on this panel today. I am by background a lawyer. I'm the type of lawyer that in England wears a wig and gown and, and judge as well. So background in humanities, but very much started in the mid um, 2010s, I suppose, to think about the impact of artificial intelligence on human rights and on humanity and the planet and our geopolitical space. So I actually taught uh, law and the impact of artificial intelligence on our legal system 
uh, before becoming the world's first chief AI ethics officer for an AI company in 2014. I then went on to be the vice chair of the IEEE's work on ethically aligned design of autonomous and intelligent systems. I was part of the Azilomar conference where we thought about um, ethical principles for AI and moved to the forum to really think about how one operationalizes good governance of artificial intelligence in 2017. Well, thank you. A lot of important work there that you're doing, Kay, and we want to be hearing more about that as well. Next, can I call on Fred, Chief Executive Officer from the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, in short, ASTAR. Frederick Chu, could you please uh, share a few words? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me on this uh, panel. i uh, really delighted to be here to share some perspectives and also to learn uh, uh, from the rest of the panel members and from this uh, Deep Tech Summit. Um, I'm in charge of ASTAR, which is the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, which is the uh, Singapore's public sector R&D agency. Our job is to do great science to power Singapore's future economy and society. ASTAR has about 5,400 employees and 4,000 over uh, scientists and engineers. Uh, by way of background, uh, I studied uh, Triple E, uh, Electrical Electronics Engineering, that was in the uh, UK at Imperial College, and I uh, also did some time uh, on a business uh, uh, degree at uh, Stanford uh, at Palo Alto. I spent 25 years uh, in the Singapore Armed Forces, uh, so I foresee myself having some interesting discussions on uh, ethics in AI with uh, Kay. Um, uh, with regards to uh, uh, military equipment and the machines. Uh, so after I transited out from the uh, Singapore Armed Forces, uh, uh, I've been uh, with uh, ASTAR since. I have a concurrent appointment as the Chief of uh, Public Sector Science and Technology uh, Policy and Planning in the Singapore government. And in that uh, portfolio, uh, my job is to try and uh, stitch together uh, the various uh, public sector science and tech uh, capabilities uh, so that uh, the sum of the uh, whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Uh, Renee Lowe, GM of Microsoft on the data and AI in Asia. Hi, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, and so I'm Microsoft's general manager for data and AI focusing on Asia. And, you know, my team really sits anywhere between India, Singapore, Australia, Japan, and China, really working with our biggest customers, both in public sector and commercial, to drive digital transformation. And we leverage both mainstream, but also the cutting edge newest tech from Microsoft to just kind of help us move into the future in terms of what we can accomplish. And as you can imagine, the types of projects that we were working on for the last at least 10 months have been very, very different from our typical projects as we've, as we've gotten pretty creative in how to recover, how to discover what the new normal is and just drive our economies forward, right? So we work across all industries and you know we've seen some industries and some geos hit a lot harder than others. One thing I have to say is digital transformation is across all borders and all industries. But unfortunately, the investment isn't uniform, right? There will be clear winners and losers. And therefore we see, you know, some retailers are online, some retailers are not, right? Some restaurants support delivery and it's integrated, some are not. And, you know, this gap is gonna continue to grow. And so I think, you know, one thing that is our mission is how do we help the companies that still have that digital divide really cross over as we move very quickly into a digital world? And how do we do this in a sustainable and responsible way? Mm, lovely, thank you for that, Renee. And we've talked about that. We can all agree that 2020 has been turned upside down by this pandemic, but I always like to look at things positively it has forced us to do things differently and look at things from a very different perspective. And more importantly, it has provided a unique opportunity for us to think about the kind of future we want. And we've seen in several announcements, if just in Singapore, our Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiat has emphasized the importance of R&D investments to prepare for critical challenges 
such as in managing the pandemic and future pandemics and ensuring food security and for Singapore to be more digital, more resilient and potentially be an advanced manufacturing base for the world. And in June, SG Innovate, because we're very, very passionate about this, announced our Deep Tech for Good initiative, which is a global partnership platform where we enable the sharing of knowledge, building and scaling deep tech solutions for economic and social good. Some of our partners to date include UNDP, UNESCAP, XPRIZE Foundation, ASAR, um, Element AI and Salesforce, just to name a few. And in September 2020, Microsoft and IDC published findings that 73% of Singapore organizations are accelerating the pace of digitalization in response to the pandemic. So there are lots of opportunities there. And as Renee mentioned, also challenges. On a global front, the World Economic Forum as the International Organization for Public-Private Cooperation is rallying governments and industries to realize a great reset for sustainable development. I'd love to hear more about that from UK later on. And to open this session, I want to get a view from the panelists on how, from your lens, the pandemic has impacted economies, industries, and societies around the world. Because I think that with the panels that we have here, it will give us nice different perspectives from the research angle, World Economic Forum angle from a global perspective, and Microsoft, the work that you're doing with corporates and other businesses around the world. I'd like to hear, perhaps maybe Kay, you could kick us off with some of your thoughts. Yes, well, I think that uh, it was mentioned earlier that actually COVID has, has created this innovation. Um, so, you know, today we're all here because we're using Zoom instead of having to fly around the world to actually come to these um, speeches. We miss that um, opportunity of just bumping into people and having good conversations, but we are enabled to um, have conversations that are actually critically important about how the world um, progresses through, through, through these media. And um, so I think that's, that's one way it, that, that we've been impacted. And just you, if you think about it, we're all having much more global conversations or capable of having much more global conversations. I think also it's interesting, Kaifu Lee, who is one of the co-chairs actually with Brad Smith from Microsoft of our Global AI Council. He um, was saying the other day that actually he felt that there would be some really interesting changes. For example, with chatbots, we will become better able to conditioned, I suppose, to use chatbots because we're using chatbots more during the COVID um, experience. And I think that that's certainly true, um, especially with people sort of using the chatbot to find out about their symptoms and things like that. And also he mentioned that perhaps post COVID or even during COVID, we will be more um, interested in working with robots than we were before because robots can't pass diseases to us in the same way as our, our um, non-masked human being um, uh, work colleagues. And, and, and again, I think we're beginning to see a little bit of that um, with, for example, some technologies to enable robots to flip and serve burgers, for example. And when we think about the future, and I think about the future a great deal, um, is that the way we want to go? And how do we think about the progress between from here to there? And how do we think about ethical progress of working with robots? Thank you, Kate. Well, definitely very interesting work with robots. In Singapore, we've got this little robot dog that runs around in a park to you know, remind people about safe distancing. And um, you're right, you know, this, uh, the, the, one of the greatest benefits is that, you know, forcing all of us to go digital has really opened borders and enabled us to have great speakers like yourself and Kai Fu Lee 
you know, have uh, attend some of our or headline some of our um, speaking slots within SG Innovate to the benefit of our community. So that's fantastic. I want to hear from Renee from what you're doing in Microsoft, right? With from the corporate lens, what are some of these challenges that you've seen, and how do you feel, or what have you seen from the pandemic? How that's impacted your world or Microsoft's world? Well, I think you know I'm based out of Singapore, and when I look at the timeline, I think we really started, you know, somewhat of a lockdown in pro probably the late January, February timeframe. And when I look at my team, right, initial set was there was a lot of fear and projects being frozen. What do we do? But then I think as we moved over, over time and folks realized, I know this, this is not a short time thing, then the one thing that happened is we actually moved a lot faster into digital, digital transformation. But as I mentioned earlier, it was not uniform. Right? And so you definitely have the large organizations with the big bank accounts that say, we're going to innovate into the future. And they're actually doing some really, really cool things. Whereas some of the companies that may not be in as much of a fluid position, they're on hold, right? They're looking for cost savings. They're looking for all those different pieces. And so we were in this divide where some were innovating into the future and some were just trying to keep the lights on and we're doing everything we can to optimize for keeping the lights on. But I think now we're almost on to month 10, right? And it has changed because I think there's a realization that we cannot just do cost savings. You must innovate into the future because the future is different than today. And so even within the hospitality and the airline in industry, we've noticed a renewed interest in creating a new experience for our customers, right? Anything that's virtual. And creating a high bar for that is incredibly important, right? I think we've all interacted with chatbots where, you know, we're pulling out our hair and it's just a little bit frustrating, right? And so I think in order for us to innovate into the future, we need to hold a high bar. We need to have trust. We need to make sure it's done in a responsible way, but also in a way that truly understands human beings, right? And the biggest thing is we don't want groups of haves and have nots, right? We don't want geographies of haves and have nots. And you know, on one hand, I, you know, I'm in a very fortunate position working at Microsoft and the world has totally shrunk for me, right? I'm able to get execs over to speak to my customers all the time because they don't have to fly anymore. But yet some other companies are struggling even to get a video conference going. And so I think you know, in this world today, it's about how do we build that new connection, right? And how do we build it in a, a, a human way that allows for human connections, but still keeps all of us safe? Definitely the pandemic has also surfaced the haves and have nots for sure. And in many ways, um, emphasize that a lot more. Fred, from your perspective, um, you're doing very important work around, that, um, around test kits, you know, in, in diagnostics um, and diagnosing COVID-19. Um, can you share with us what you've seen and your perspective from ASTAR? Yeah, I'll, I'll share some perspectives, not only just from ASTAR, but uh, as, a, as a public servant looking at how things have you know, evolved over the past uh, 10 months. Uh, I would say that Singapore continues to be in the fight to wrestle down uh, COVID, just like many other countries across the world. Uh, as we can see from around the world, there are ups and downs in this uh, campaign. Uh, right now, uh, we seem to be having some respite uh, in the and the various measures that we put in place, uh, we hope that they are taking effect. Uh, I think we've gone a few days uh, without local uh, transmission, uh, but who knows what the future may hold. I think what's important is that uh, we continue to work as a whole government, a whole of nation, I would say, uh, to, uh, to face down uh, COVID. Uh, the economic impact uh, has not been uh, insignificant. Um, you know, there have been headlines about Singapore Airlines and the challenges uh, that we face uh, uh, in the aviation sector. And the reality was that many, many industries in Singapore was linked to the aviation uh, sector. So we're taking a hit there. Uh, what we're trying to do now is to tie everyone through as much as possible uh, in the hope that uh, with uh, vaccines uh, coming online, we can uh, restore uh, air travel soon. Maybe not to the same extent as prior to COVID for quite a number of years to come, but uh, at least we hit in the right direction. The consumer facing industries have also taken a hit um, uh, with regards to eateries, uh, retail, 
and um, as uh, Rene has uh, mentioned, many are trying to pivot uh, digitally uh, to survive and maybe thrive uh, in the future with new business uh, models. Overall, I would say the country is trying to uh, emerge stronger. I think that is the, the rallying call that we have for everyone to emerge stronger. And uh, we are digging deep to work hard uh, during this period as a country. Uh, there are a few key strategies here, I would say. Uh, uh, Singapore continues to stay open, and that's very important. Uh, I think we are witnessing around the world uh, due to uh, uh, not only just COVID, but uh, before that, uh, tensions uh, 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 geopolitically. We're starting to see uh, countries moving their supply chains, right, to just in case as opposed to just in time, which means everyone is trying to onshore uh, and uh, protectionism is on the rise. Uh, for Singapore, we are committed to stay open. Uh, in fact, uh, we think that's critical. You know, recently, uh, just about three days ago, the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership was signed. Uh, that was uh, Singapore and 14 other countries, uh, including uh, heavyweight countries in the Asia Pacific. And so that's critical uh, to keep things open uh, for global trade to continue to thrive. Uh, so stay open. Singapore continues to want to see ourselves not only as a landing pad, but also increasingly a launch pad uh, to uh, protect companies who come to Singapore to help them project into this part of the world, Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific. I would say another facet of our response here would be the long-term commitment to research and development, I think which uh, Ziki has talked about. Uh, it was, I think, in the height of, um, of the COVID crisis for Singapore um, during a uh, some would call it lockdown in the West, we call it a circuit breaker. Uh, towards the tail end of that, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister announced uh, uh, our next five-year uh, commitment towards R&D, uh, which was more than what we put in, in the last five years. And uh, the figure of over 20 billion uh, was announced. Uh, there'll be more details about that in the upcoming months. But this shows again the Singapore's approach, which is that we believe in steady long-term investments. Uh, through good times, through bad times, to build capability for the future. And we believe uh, with that commitment to R&D, to deep tech, uh, which is what this summit is focused on, uh, we will come out stronger. Uh, last but not least, I would say that uh, another facet of our overall strategy is really digitalization en masse. Uh, and that is happening. And we will continue to push that hard uh, for digital transformation and innovation. Thank you, Fred. You've covered so much in there, which I, I do want to delve a bit uh, more around, you know, our refreshed economic strategy. Um, but let's let's talk a bit more about that um, later on. K is very interesting when I was um, looking at the World Economic Forum's Great Reset Initiative. This really would have great benefit and impact. Um, to COVID-19. Maybe you could share with us. Tell us what this Great Reset Initiative is and, um, and share how it will be able to help us um, on a path towards a more resilient, livable economy. Thank you for, for that question. But first, let me just sort of come back to some of the things that Renee and Fred were saying, because I think that they're terribly important. Renee talked about trust. And I think that we're at this point in time when trust in the technology that we are going to be using, if we're going to digitalize a lot, we need to build that trust. And she also mentioned the word responsible. And so when I think about how we use AI, I'm thinking about trust and responsibility. And so it's so good for me to be invited to speak in Singapore, because of course, um, my team worked with the Singaporean government to create that ethical framework for companies who are going to be using and innovating with artificial intelligence. And there's all that um, uh, old phrase about you know, innovation um, is impeded by regulation. Well, here Singapore put together something that will not impede innovation, but will give a roadmap to companies as they, as they begin to innovate. 
with a technology which has its challenges as well as its benefits. So, so I, I just wanted to take up that, that point and the fact that, you know, creating ethical frameworks for AI actually builds your resilience for the future. Because if we get it wrong, and we've used it, we've deployed it in education and healthcare and agriculture and, and um, aeronautics, then we have a big problem. Uh, and the great example of that, and this takes me to the great reset, is for example, the use of AI um, in human resources. So we have a project on creating guidelines for companies that are going to use AI in that situation because we know that, um, that a lot of bias can be created um, when we create the algorithms that and train the algorithms uh, for anything. But in human resources, the great example, of course, is of the bank that um, trained the algorithm on the data of who'd been successful previously. And uh, that meant that it only chose white men from a very few universities. So those are the sort of things we've got to build the frameworks to um, support the use of artificial intelligence in order to continue to build resilience. And it's, it's very important that when we're thinking about the great reset and um, how we move forward, then um, getting those frameworks and governance with a small g right of, of these digital um, assets is, is as important as what we can create with them. Um, I wanted then to sort of move to uh, ESG, which of course, um, you know, is about the environment, about social and about governance. And we've talked about adding a T to that because technology should probably be part of what companies think about. Um, and Renee again mentioned that, that there are some companies that are being successful because they're already up and running with the, with the technology. But actually I would say that the technology covers all three of E, S and G. So um, if you think about the environment, you know, we can begin to use AI to deal with some of those things like climate change, for example. If we look at social, um, I, we've got a fellow from Microsoft at the moment who's looking at how you use AI to interdict slavery, for example. And, um, and then in the, corporate, in the corporate governance piece, uh, we know that you have to be careful when you're governing AI. And uh, we, we have a number of different projects looking at how you govern AI without um, interrupting the inno innovation. So those are the, those are the sort of key tools that we think that are needed to re redesign our world post COVID. Thank you, Kay. Uh, Renee, I want to just leading on from what Kay mentioned, um, I think the importance of AI and data, I think that's critical with, especially, you know, as we are all going digital or accelerated in, in, in our digitalization. Um, the other threat, the other big threat is in the area of cybersecurity. What are your views on creating a digital economy that's built on trust, security, and responsibility? You know, first things first, it's, it's critical, right? I'm, I'm privileged enough to work at a company that uh, can make an impact globally on making it safe for digital citizens. And as you know, Microsoft spends over a billion dollars a year on cybersecurity. And recently there were hacking attempts on seven high profile pharmaceutical companies and vaccine researchers in Canada, in France, in India, in South Korea, in US, who are looking for the answer to COVID-19, right? And I think while on one hand, you know, Microsoft continues to fight and protect through encryption, dual factor authentication, leveraging actually a lot of AI to recognize these ever-changing threats. I actually wanna go back to Fred's point uh, on digital skilling and digital savviness, right? Because from a cybersecurity perspective, we can provide as much as we can, but we also need the digital citizens to be very savvy, 
right? We go back to the seven high profile pharmaceutical companies that were being hacked uh, because they were you know, developing COVID-19 solutions. While some of them were hacked like password spraying and stuff that you know, we can handle on our side, others were really spear phishing emails, right? Enticing people to hand over their passwords, uh, either posing as job recruiting messages or you know, even worse, pretending to share COVID-19 data. Right, so I think you know everyone needs to have a role in kind of earning trust and responsible use of tech, right? And something like responsible AI is at the core of how we build our products, and we operationalize it through principles, frameworks, assets, and committees that have real power, right? Not just committees that are there as figureheads, and um, we share this with our customers so we can all be a little bit further on that journey of building a safer and more inclusive future. And I think the key is that we have to be in it together, right? And that is why we work together with our customers on not only what can we provide, but what can they do in terms of building on top of it and training, right? Training, and I'm sure we've all heard about how Microsoft had the goal of training 25 million people worldwide by the end of the year. We've made progress, right? We've trained about 13 million already, but that progress is not enough, right? And so continuously, driving up the digital savviness, because while we try to make the world a safer place, the threats continue to change. Thank you. And it's all about collaboration, isn't it? I always say that it's really the sum of all parts. Every single group is doing something in our own individual areas, but it's really the sum of all parts that really matter. And it's collaborating between corporates, startups, government, you know, that really make it all work. And I think the, the importance of collaborating as partnerships is really critical in driving innovation and in seeing some of these successes. I want to take the discussion back a little bit. I'm very interested to know um, the work that ASA is doing, Fred, because the things that um, you're doing is um, very important in our battle against this pandemic. So over the years, um, we've seen Singapore and particularly ASTAR uh, has developed very strong capabilities to manage infectious diseases. And I guess we are now reaping the benefits of all those years of investment and research that um, ASTAR has done. And uh, we've seen that since the pandemic struck, ASTAR has rolled out several diagnostics test kits. I'd like to get, um, I'm interested to hear Frederick, how ASTAR has been strengthening your capabilities in areas such as genomics, bioinformatics, data analytics to build a strong ecosystem for Singapore to be a hub to study and tackle infectious diseases. Thank you, Ziki. Um, indeed, you're right. The uh, investments that Singapore government has put into the health and biomedical space, for example, has uh, really paid off. Uh, actually, it paid off over the years. Uh, whenever infectious disease uh, arises, whether in SARS, uh, Zika, uh, H5N1, and now um, uh, COVID. So what this reinforces for many of us is that R&D has to be the long game. We have to think far. Uh, that means not only do we need to move fast, right, in terms of uh, converting research to innovation to enterprise, we really need to think far as well and to stay the course on some of our uh, investments. Um, <clears throat> I would say that uh, the COVID response in Singapore wasn't just an A-star play. Actually, what we, have, what we are witnessing is actually a whole of government, a whole of nation effort. And that's what is partly heartening for me when I see the different parts of the ecosystem where we have built up capability coming together, stitching it together for the good of Singapore, Singaporeans, and also to further the cause of science. So let me, let me give some examples of how uh, we are doing that and also share along the way some things that ASTAR is uh, doing. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the uh, overall uh, whole government response for, uh, let's say, test kits, um, the initial test kit that was rolled out uh, the Fortitude test kit was actually a collaboration between uh, Tantok Singh Hospital, ASTAR, uh, with samples from the National Public Health uh, Laboratory. Some of the digitalization technologies which are ongoing throughout the whole ecosystem, not only ASTAR, uh, for example, chest X-rays, using AI to mine uh, chest X-rays, 
uh, that takes place in collaboration between the clinicians as well as the R&D houses. I can cite an example where Tan Tok Singh has collaborated with ASTAR to read chest x-rays uh, using AI, and that helps us to triage the patients that come in uh, to the hospitals. Uh, even in something like cough droplets uh, or droplets dispersion, you know that it's such a critical thing to understand how droplet, uh, droplets are dispersed. And uh, we had a strong collaboration between Singh Health, uh, infectious disease, uh, as well as respiratory uh, doctors and ASTAR, where we modeled how speaking, coughing, sneezing would propagate droplets and uh, how a mask or face shield would be very uh, useful in terms of uh, cutting out that transmission path. And that has helped to inform uh, national policy. Uh, we're also using uh, 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 multi uh, capabilities from different parts of ecosystem to model how different environments, uh, whether at the Esplanade, whether zoo, you know, universal studios, etc., all, all our public places, right? How safe we can keep them with a combination of masks as well as uh, uh, airing the place. Um, and all these require deep capabilities in computational fluid dynamics, modeling and simulation, which ASTAR has worked on with the universities, uh, as well as some of our public agencies who are in charge of those uh, uh, public spaces. And so that has given us confidence in how we are trying to slowly uh, reopen the economy to regain uh, a normalcy. Diagnostics is another example. Here, it's not just whole of government, it's really whole of nation, where we try to have a triple helix model, where we bring industry together with the public agency, together with uh, uh, academia. And we have quite a number of examples. For example, uh, the Fortitude Test Kit, the Resolute Test Kit that was done between DSO and ASTAR, uh, which is a direct uh, a PCR test kit bypassing the RNA extraction stage. And that has also seen commercialization with advanced uh, med tech holdings. The CPAS neutralizing antibody test kit between Duke NUS, uh, ASAR DXD hub, and GenScript is another example. Um, so in summary, I would say that lots of capabilities built up over the years uh, are coming together. What we've found to be critical is to have last mile translation platforms. In this case, the Diagnostics Development Hub uh, played a very critical role, bringing on board IP and innovations from throughout the ecosystem, not just ASTAR, uh, from NUS, from NTU, from Duke NUS, and then working with companies so that the companies can realize value, help public health, uh, but also create new uh, economic growth opportunities. Thank you. A very strong theme there, Fred, uh, as you um, talked. I felt that the very strong theme that came across was this, the strength of partnership and collaboration. And um, I think the other great thing too is that whatever work it is that we're doing in Singapore um, is gonna be beneficial, not just for Singapore, but really the world because, um, and we at SG Innovate always believe that, you know, with deep tech, Deep Tech has a very strong place when it comes to being able to produce solutions to address some of the pressing global issues because a lot of issues are not geographically bound. It is really international and global around, you know, healthcare, aging population, and that's where I think innovation and technology would be very beneficial um, on a, it has great impact on a global scale. I want to stay a little bit, I mean, Right, Singapore's DPM, we unveiled um, the refreshed economic strategy. And this strategy is centered on innovation, inclusivity, and sustainability, and is to pave the way for Singapore's economy to emerge from the pandemic. We want to be emerge stronger and be more resilient. And this is really open to the floor. I want to get, um, maybe Fred, I start with you. Uh, you've touched a lot on a little bit uh, on this, but Specifically, what, what um, again, is the sum of all parts, but what is ASTAR's role in making this future happen? And from Renee and Kay's perspective, I know, you know, Microsoft talked about sustainability. How do you, you know, reducing the carbon footprint? I want to get a view on that. And I think, Kay, from what you've, um, you, what you've been working on, I'm sure you have a perspective on how we can be using innovation, inclusivity, and inclusivity and sustainability to be able to pave the way for our future. Um, can I ask you to start, Fred? 
Sure, thanks, uh, Zuki. Um, yes, our, our leaders have painted quite a compelling vision of how we want to emerge stronger together and what uh, our economic strategies are for the next uh, uh, 10, 20 years. Uh, key to that is the role of science and technology, the role of deep tech, the role of digital transformation and innovation. So all those things are coming uh, uh, together. And if you think about it, uh, for a constrained country like Singapore, right, whether we're talking about land, whether we're talking about manpower, and increasingly we are talking about carbon budgets, right? Uh, the answer really has to be science and tech. The good news for us is that uh, all our kids growing up through school win all the science and math competitions uh, uh, worldwide. So actually, we, don't, we are not starting off from a bad place. We, we actually have a good base. And then the question is how uh, a triple helix uh, work together between academia, public sector, as well as industry to create value uh, for Singapore, Singaporeans, for science, and also for all the companies uh, that are in Singapore, and also, of course, to, uh, to uh, create value for the world. Um, <clears throat> I'll give a specific example, or maybe two examples, of uh, how ASTAR is doing our part uh, within this entire economic strategy um, to, uh, to push uh, um, the uh, future of manufacturing along. Uh, future of manufacturing is important for Singapore. More than 20% of our GDP is counted for by manufacturing. In fact, when you look at what has happened during COVID, it was manufacturing that was an important mainstay uh, in terms of... Uh, of uh, providing some ballast and stability. Uh, so future of manufacturing, essentially what we're trying to do is to bring digitalization uh, into manufacturing, which is otherwise known as Industry 4.0. So that is going on full steam here. ASTAR, we do our part. We have a translation platform called the Advanced Remanufacturing Technology Center, as well as SimTech. At any one time, they work with about 500 over uh, local companies, including overseas companies, to improve manufacturing processes uh, using a uh, digitalization. Uh, besides the imparting of technology, we also strongly believe the belief in imparting expertise. So what we do, we transfer people as well to help companies, and we also transfer uh, business strategy, technology thinking, so that we can help our companies internalize technologies and move forward quickly and to seize opportunities. Uh, we've re recently created Innovation Factory, and that would help companies scale up and go in from components to actually products. Another area I'd like to highlight is sustainability because that was touched upon uh, uh, by you, Ziki, and that's critical going forward. Uh, that huge manufacturing base in Singapore, it has to be with full consideration of sustainability. And uh, what we're trying to do now uh, within ASTAR is to work with the Ministry of Trade Industry with EDB uh, to look at decarbonization test bits, test centers, uh, so that all oh, major manufacturers, uh, as well as uh, those in the petrochem industry in Singapore uh, are able to test the latest technologies to lower the carbon footprint. Last but not least in food. Food is something we've got to do as a country to make a virtue out of necessity. Uh, you've heard, heard of the 30 by 30 goals. What is exciting in Singapore is that our deep tech base is actually going to food, uh, whether in biotransformation, the use of fermentation, whether in coupling genomics together with food to understand uh, uh, what works for different types of phenotypes uh, or whether to use uh, our AI and digitization know-how into farming, i.e. urban farming, uh, because we are land constrained. So these are exciting uh, areas and ASA will continue to work with uh, the rest of the ecosystem to try and propel all these along. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Renee, over to you. Share with us from the perspective of uh, Microsoft's very aggressive pledge to bring your direct waste footprint to zero by 2030. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of efforts, um, both internally and externally, that are going on. And I'll focus a little bit more on the internal efforts directly related to the effort around uh, the 2030 uh, uh, just kind of uh, mark. Um, a couple things is, you know, from an operations product packaging perspective, we are moving to 100% recyclable, right? So imagine your Surface device, right? Your laptop being 100% recyclable along with the packaging. We have, of course, within our own offices, when we were, we were in their offices, we had moved everything to recyclable materials. I remember there was a transition between uh, you know, water bottles, like plastic water bottles, and then we start calling each other out. But one thing I do want to touch a little bit more on is the work on the circular data centers, right? And I, 
I, you know, our data centers, it's funny, I talk to customers and I say, hey, you want to be more sustainable? Go on Azure, use our data centers. And they laugh at me. And I'm like, no, actually, I'm semi serious because as of 2012, our Azure data centers are already carbon neutral. All right. But sometimes carbon neutral is, it's not enough, right? Because carbon neutral, it's about energy. But when you look at a data center, there's also water uh, and you know, recirculating that water instead of taking it out and polluting the environment. Um, there's also server uh, uh, server components, right? When you have uh, different servers within your data uh, within your DC, the typical life cycle is about three to five years, right? And this is one of the biggest issues from an e-waste perspective. What do you do with all these server components? And so basically we take these and we break them down on premises, right? We take the decommissioned servers and we either break down and reuse them in another, another setting, or we actually recycle them on premises, right? And so that's what we're actually calling the circular data center where we actually start reusing a lot of those components and kind of handling it within the data center itself as opposed to pushing it out. And of course, you know, we continue to leverage data and AI uh, in, in terms of developing tech for good, right? And within Microsoft itself, we are working with organizations like Circular ID for clothing reuse, right? When you look at the landfills, a ton of it is really just clothing, right? We're working with FoodX to lower food waste. We're working with other organizations to really, uh, you know, jointly build recycling tracking systems, e-waste tracking systems. And we spend billions internally in R&D, but of course we leave no stone unturned, right? And so we work deeply with our partners because we want our data centers to be the most efficient, the most clean, the most sustainable cloud out there. And so we work with our suppliers to make their, their devices easier to break down and recycle. I already said three to five year cycles, we have to break them down. They have to be easy to break down. So we have to work together with our suppliers. We push on our supply chains to be a lot more efficient. And um, there's a lot more that we're investing in. But I think the one thing we do wanna look at is there needs to be a lot more ideas, right? And there needs to be a lot of innovation on the space for us to really move into a carbon neutral, right? And just really uh, disappearing that footprint. And so the one thing that drives innovation is diversity and thought, right? And so we continue to invest in efforts like DigiGirls, where we encourage school age girls to embark on the tech path. We continue to in, in invest in efforts like TechSpark, where we bring technology and opportunities to rural areas and underserved minorities. We continue to have tons and tons of hackathons and we continue to enable our partners who are also driving AI for good and AI for earth and all of those specific efforts. Because while we are making progress and good progress at that, we always have to recognize that we need diversity and thought to drive the innovation that will bring us to the next phase. Thank you, Renee. I mean, definitely diversity is, is key. We touched a bit, uh, a little bit about that. You know, we talked about um, the source of data for as, as, as AI systems build the algorithms. Um, Kay, do you have anything to add from that perspective with, um, um, with regards to AI and data perhaps, you know, in how we could um, emerge stronger and how that could help drive innovation, inclusivity and sustainability? Yeah, well, certainly. Um, so, you know, I've been talking about ethical or responsible AI, but I think that businesses could just think about this as being problems that they have to solve if they want their AI tools to work well. So there's a Gartner study that says that by 2022, if we don't start tackling bias, 85% of algorithms that we create will actually be erroneous. Now, there's no point in you putting R&D into creating algorithms and doing great things with them if then you're going to end up with that problem. So I think that uh, it's an important place to start. What are the problems? How do, we, how do we deal with the problems so that we can go on and do some of the fantastic work that we're capable of doing? And it might be that I sound as if I'm the naysayer in this group, but I'm really not. I believe passionately in the power of AI to do good, um, but we do need to make sure that we don't bring the problems along with us. And Professor Schwab's talked about um, stakeholder capitalism 
and really our duty to see the world as a whole, to see that everybody um, has their boats lifted by the fourth industrial revolution. And I think that perhaps as we close, we, need, we could think about the Trillion Trees Initiative, the fact that what we, when we're talking about deep tech, tech and the creation of deep tech, actually what we're talking about is helping humanity and the planet. Um, otherwise, we shouldn't really be going there. We should be thinking, therefore, about human-centered design, about, as you said, collaborative design, keeping our borders open so that we can benefit from data passing between us which actually might then allow us to make progress uh, together uh, as a world. Okay, that is so compelling and so powerful and is so apt because we are, I feel that, you know, we've, we've touched on so many things, but if we had more time, I think we could continue for another hour because it's such an important topic and you, you are, each of you are such experts in your own areas. Unfortunately, we are three minutes into the end of our session and I think um, it's important and uh, apt right now to get a view or closing remarks from each of um, the panelists here um, on your thoughts in terms of how uh, we can be looking forward and the importance of science and technology. Just closing remarks. If I can start with you, Renee. Yeah, so in closing, I'd say digital transformation is a reality, right? It's not just a buzzwords. And if you haven't taken the first steps already, it's time to seriously consider how your organization is going to thrive in the new world, right? And there's an urgency here, right? As this pandemic hit, we saw ourselves deploying teams in like 3 million, 2 million, like millions and millions upon of seats in weeks, right? Some in 27 hours actually in Vietnam. And so there's an agility, but while there is the piece around deploying with urgency and agility, do not forget that these are widespread solutions that we are putting out there. And so you must take a step back and say, am I doing this in a responsible and sustainable way? Because when we roll out technology at scale, if mistakes are made, they are also made at scale. And so the one thing that I ask is, as you consider, please have a responsible AI framework if you, you know, don't yet have one, look at you know, Microsoft's website. There's many different sources out there, but um, make sure that you are making the changes, but you are making the changes in a very fair, transparent, and responsible way. Thank you. Fred? Thank you, Zuki. <clears throat> um, I thought it's been a fascinating discussion. I'd like to thank my panelists, for, fellow panelists, for all the insights. Uh, I've learned a lot. Um, my own uh, parting shot would be this, uh, for those who are attending this uh, Deep Tech uh, Summit, uh, my encouragement would be for your companies, for your agencies, uh, for, uh, to really reimagine the future. Um, I believe that we are at this continuity and uh, the future uh, lies uh, with science and tech. And so we have to, uh, I mean, in the words of uh, uh, that famous film, uh, Dead Poets of Society, right? Kappa Day, and right? you have to seize the day uh, with science and tech. Uh, last but not least, I would like to say that uh, um, that Singapore uh, continues to be a very welcoming place, as well as I would say a happening place to do science and tech in. I look forward to more companies and more uh, academics, etc., uh, thinking about Singa making Singapore your base uh, for which to cover our niche and do exciting things related to science and tech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred and Kay. Just building on what Fred said, yes, science and technology is the future, but I would say responsible so development of science and technology is the future. Collaboration um, for our future. And also every AI, every company will be an AI company. So we've got to work out how you get from here to how, get, how you get to responsible deployment of artificial intelligence. Thank you, Kay. And I want to say that at the center of everything that we do is a human being and how it impacts that human being. So there is a huge responsibility as we've covered. We've covered so much ground here 
And I would like to thank my panelists for bringing together such a deep, rich discussion and for kicking off the Deep Tech Summit in such a powerful way. I want to thank everyone for tuning in and I would like to invite everybody to stay on and enjoy the rest of the session at the Deep Tech Summit. And with that, thank you and we'll see you soon.